Yeah, this has been super fun, first of all, to see all of your presentations. Um, I'm going to go from the hard sciences the whole way to the other side and do music and like human research. Um, so, and I also have completely written out my presentation and I'm not going to do that because <laughs> none of you have just read a presentation. Um, so first, can I just get a hand if you know anything about Chilean music at all? I don't okay, <laughs> this, this is just helping me to know how to gauge my presentation for you all um, for this. So um, my project is entitled um, The Legacies of Margaret Loyola, Gender, Nation, and Tradition in Chilean Folk Music. So sort of the three main theoretical angles that I'm looking at my research is um, through gender. So um, asking how is music gendered, how is um, feminine or women's identity expressed through music. Um, that has one major impact. Um, the next is nation. Um, so if we think about um, national identity, nationalism, um, it has a completely um, or very interesting um, concept in this country that is so geographically disparate. How do you create a national identity through culture, through musical practices in particular? Um, and how has that been changing over recent years? There's this concept of like the nations in crisis and that's sort of like a moment when national identity is most um, pronounced and um, able to be changed is when the country is like going through major crises like the country has seen over the past few years. Um, and then um, I'll also be looking at tradition, which um, is a common concept in my field, which I'll get to in a minute, um, of understanding how musical practices are passed down um, over generations um, and how then social memory um, is impacted and how people understand what even tradition means. Um, so a little bit about me, um, I am a PhD candidate in ethnomusicology at the University of California, Riverside. Um, I am trained in classical performance, so um, I was originally a bassoonist, I have my undergrad in um, music performance, we don't really have the option to study ethnomusicology as undergrads, um, so it's a primarily um, yeah, graduate degree. Um, so I have been learning guitar since the pandemic began, so this picture is from my premiere concert which was this past week. <laughs> um, so I've been learning guitar specifically for this research. Um, I studied abroad in Chile in 2016, so that's what that photo is, um, me as a little undergrad in Valparaiso, um, and that's how I got into my research, was coming here, um, sort of begrudgingly bringing my bassoon and then getting connected with the music community um, and then the folk music community as a result, um, and just, yeah, playing lots of music with people. Um, and then I'm affiliated with the Universidad Alberto Hurtado in um, Santiago, and my, um, what is it called? Like primary sponsor is Lorena Valle Benito, who um, researches um, a lot along a lot of the same theoretical lines as me. So um, looking at um, gender, feminine canon, specifically with Violeta Padra, um, and um, also some work in music education as well. Um, I also have affiliations that I forgot to put on the slide um, with the Fondo Marco Loyola, which is um, an archive in Valparaiso um, at the La Católica um, there. And then also um, the National Academy for Traditional Culture, uh, Margaret Loyola, um, which is run by a director, but also um, partially run by her widower. So I have connections directly with the folklorists that I'm researching. So um, to give you a little introduction into um, who Margaret Loyola is, because she's sort of surrounding my entire project. Um, so Margaret Loyola um, was a researcher, performer, and teacher. Um, who lived from uh, 1918 to 2015, so she really recently passed away. Um, and she um, was started performing as a musician when she was like 12 or 13, so she has an over 80 year career. Um, and she is consistently cited to be one of the greatest teachers of Chilean folk music. Um, so just so for some background of her significance, um, Violeta Parra, um, who I recently mentioned, cited her as the most Chilean of the Chileans. And then, um, Poet Pablo Neruda, um, who hopefully most of you know of, um, named her, quote, the ultimate empress of Chile and its songs, the voice of the people, end quote. So those two quotes alone are like enough to unpack for like an oh, entire chapter. <laughs> um, so, and her career started um, in 1944. She recorded dozens of songs, as a, both as a soloist and ensemble member. Um, she taught music 
dance and fieldwork methodologies, um, and she published six educational books about traditional music and dance. Um, and most of the songs included in those books are from the 18 or 1900s. They're um, not as much being played today, and that's part of what my research is looking at as well. Um, so these are incredible accomplishments for any musician during the 20th century, um, let alone um, when it was a period when it was difficult for women to advance academically and professionally as a musician. Um, and then today, as I mentioned, there's an Academy of Traditional Music um, in her name. There is um, the archive that I'll be working at, and there's a Roots Music Prize, which Zoe and I saw the sign for at a music shop yesterday, um, that it goes on um, annually um, that is also in her name. So there's a lot of work and promotion being done to remember her legacy and how she impacted Chilean folk music. Um, so this is sort of my big theoretical question. Um, looking at how her performances, written texts, and pedagogical practices shaped national conceptions of tradition and womanhood in the past, and then how her students today um, operate within and beyond, beyond those to preserve her legacy. Um, so it will be partially biographical in nature, um, because I have to you know, reassemble some missing histories that have not been documented by other um, Chilean scholars. Um, but I'm more interested in how others perceived her, and so it's not merely biographical, but trying to look at broader impacts. Um, so the folk music scene that sort of exists right now um, is, yeah, based on like her students who they call themselves discipulas or disciples, which doesn't translate nicely into, <laughs> yeah, into English. Um, um, or I also have heard the term like loyalista, like soy una loyalista. <laughs> um, and so, um, the scene that is created has sort of spread across Chile in academic institutions, performances, compositions, folkloric ensembles that continue today. Um, so if um, Loyola is considered to be this portal into Chilean culture or considered to be the soul of Chile, um, it is crucial to examine how she trained current musicians and educators um, to understand their own nation state, um, as well as the gender biases that are enmeshed within this. Um, and again, if we put this in the context of today with the Estado Social in 2019, um, and then um, the most recent upcoming presidency, um, this role of folklore that has been existing as a scholarly field and as a musical practice for over 100 years at this point, um, this is a very timely um, time for us to, for, to be analyzing um, the role of folk music in society today. Um, so, um, despite this, um, so we have a little background on Chilean musicians in general. They, uh, many Chilean musicians hold really significant positions within the country's public sphere and national identity and memory, social memory. Um, most prominently, um, Violeta Parra and Victor Jara um, are cited as these like progenitors um, of the Nueva Canción movement, which was the movement that occurred um, during Allende's, um, Allende's um, socialist movements and then afterwards during the dictatorship as protest music. Um, so, but what is interesting is that they both um, directly and indirectly worked with Loyola as well. Um, and she also um, promoted social justice and did social justice music, um, but it was, it's not really talked about at all, basically. Um, so that's some of the historical work that I will be um, looking at. Um, and she, um, Actually, that's all I'm going to say about that because we're already nine minutes in. Great. Um, so some of the musicians that I'm hoping to work with um, in this upcoming nine months um, who have done, um, you have recorded music um, and worked with Loyola. Um, so most prominently, he's Hebe is like the most famous one. Um, so that's like my I'm like three degrees of separation away from getting contact for an interview. So I'm like hoping that will work. Um, but so, but musicians like Hebe um, have both studied with Loyola and then also um, had a major voice within the protest recently. Um, so understanding how um, musicians like Hebe learned folk music from her. Um, and then also use that to then record um, folk music and then also be involved in protest movements. Um, other important contexts is the recent feminist movements that have sort of been occurring for the past 10 years or so. Um, and one prominent musician that has worked with Loyola as well is Andrea Andreu, and there's like a whole host of women musicians that I'm hoping to be working with as well for this. 
um, that have been recording feminist anthems in particular, um, and then also um, play and um, perform folk music. Um, does that make sense so far? Everyone's on board? Okay, great. So um, what I will be doing, um, we kind of joke in ethnomusicology that we make a plan and then as soon as you get to the country or your field site, you throw it all out the window and kind of restart um, because you're working with humans and you can't control any of it, but I'm understanding that the sciences are kind of like that too, so that makes me oh, yeah. feel a little bit better. <laughs> um, but this is sort of my like plan as with regards to also quarantine and like how open things are, how much access I'll have. Um, so I'm hoping to start archival work in um, the Fondo Margot Loyola, um, which is basically where um, all of her um, documents are. Um, so I'm looking particularly at um, the time period for this between the 50s and 70s when a lot of her research um, expanded understandings of cultural patrimony beyond ethnic nationalism. Mm -hmm. um, some of that goes into more complex um, ideas such as um, this slide that I have where she's like performing um, indigenous Rapanui music with indigenous people and that gets into complex things that today would be like, oh, cultural appropriation, but in the 50s it had a different, you know, um, cultural relevance, I guess, um, in promoting sort of, um, in um, constructing a new national identity that included populations that typically were not included. Um, and then I'm also interested, so sorry, so that will be a lot of um, looking at her actual research documents, um, so field notes, field recordings, um, letters of communication, um, etc. Um, there's a lot of information in the archives that I can just spend hours there. Um, and then I'm also interested in a lot of the public media that was released during the dictatorship um, to understand how um, she was kind of co-opted as a symbol of like ideal Chilean culture um, through her performances and um, yeah, representing patrimony through that. Um, so one of the main musical genres that she is a proponent of is um, the tonada, which I can perform an example for you all now. Just to liven things up. So I didn't mention also I will be taking private lessons um, on guitar and most likely harp and maybe some other instruments because why not? Um, so um, I will. I'm not playing this song even though the song is great, but um, I'll just play part of another one. So most of the music is um, is all guitar and voice, and like that's it. So that's what a lot of the music I'll be researching is. Um, there are of course a lot of other genres, but um, for the sake of time, I'm going to keep moving. So my other my second phase when things are open, which I think I can start this pretty soon, um, is interviews and oral histories with um, Loyola students. Um, so looking at how they sort of um, claim this identity as a student of Loyola um, to sort of legitimate their identity as a musician, um, and then how they are continuing to reinterpret and perform traditional music. Um, so this will include um, like just folk musicians who play folk music and that's it. It will include music educators who studied with her. This will include a lot of singer-songwriters as well who studied with her. Um, and yes, and then, um, and most of the access I have to that network is through um, my guitar teacher who I worked with when I was studying abroad here um, previously. Um, and then finally, the last phase will um, be looking with music ensembles, um, so um, such as Conjunto Cucumen, which is one of the most famous um, folkloric music ensembles that um, Loyola started in the 50s. Um, so, and they are still going strong today, so I'm hoping to um, conduct research with them. Um, and then 
separate from my research, um, mainly because of IRB things, um, I will be um, working with children's Latin American music ensembles and orchestras um, to have some good cross-cultural engagement that is part of the full rig <laughs> um, initiative. So. Um, yeah, so again, I'm a PhD candidate. Um, I've written tons of papers on this topic, um, and um, I'm so excited to like actually begin the research in the country. Um, and then I'm at time, right? Yeah, you're just about at time. Okay, then, yeah, we can pause and stop there. That's pretty much it. So. Hey.